All right, and welcome to Better Understanding the Bible. I'm your host, Alice, and let's get to it. In this episode, The New Heavens and the New Earth, Genesis 1 and Revelation 21. It's not a physical creation, it's a covenant creation. So let's take a look at what is commonly called the creation uh, record, the creation event. Uh, What we're looking at here is the common teaching of a physical beginning of the universe. So somehow this prime material world that we live in and its start. We're going to take a look at that and see that there's actually quite a few major issues that go along with that interpretation of Genesis 1 and what that could possibly mean to our view of what the Bible has to say. So let's take a quick read and familiarize ourselves with the topic. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Now the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and there was morning and evening the first day. When we jump down to day four, we read, And there will and the God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. God set them in the expanse of the heavens to rule over the day and to rule over the night and to separate the light from the darkness, the fourth day. Now, most of us in general are pretty uh, familiar with these scriptures. However, if we listen to what they say, there's some interesting issues that appear. So, for example, in Genesis 1, it says, Let there be light, and there was, and God called the light day. Well, that creates an interesting situation here, because when we read Genesis 4, God, here in Genesis 1, separated the light from the darkness. But in Genesis 4, God created the lights, the greater light, to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. So here we have that for the purpose of separating the light from the darkness. So interestingly, we have the greater light to rule the day. And in Genesis 1, God said, let there be light, and God called the light day. So here we have their light in Genesis 1. However, the light that rules that day was not created till day 4. So in day 1, there's no source to that light. God said, let there be light, and he called the light day. And he divided it from the darkness and called it night. Well, where's that? what is that light? Now, some could argue that uh, that light is God himself, but the problem is then God wouldn't need to say, let there be light, because if God was there hovering over the face of the waters, his light was there. So God said, let there be light, and there was, but there was no sun. That wasn't created till day four from a literal rendering. And now God separated the light from the darkness. That creates another problem because this greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night were there to separate the light from the darkness. Well, there's now some confusion. Which is it? Did God separate the light from the darkness? Or did these lights that God created separate the light from the darkness? See, like it's really con- like this whole idea is kind of off because it's separated by three days. So what is the light that God said, let there be light, and there was light? Because if there was light, there was no sun. So there's no sunlight. There's no source to this light. That's a, that's a major contradiction in this story setting if we're reading it from a literal rendering. Now on top of that, we get this really peculiar paradox because it says at the very end uh, of the first day, it says, and there was evening and there was morning. Well, this brings up a further issue because in day four, the sun and the moon were made. Well, days, well, they're they're associated with the astrological appearing of the sun. The sun comes and goes. That's the day. Then the moon comes. That's the night, the evening. So here we have the morning and the evening 
but there's no sun, there's no moon. So how is there, how can you delineate time? How can you actually say there was a morning and a t- an evening? There's no sun or moon to delineate this event. All that happened in this day was God said, let there be light, and some kind of light appeared, and then that showed that there was a contrast of darkness, and it's being separated, and God favored the light over the darkness. So it's very interesting that there was a first day. There's no moon or sun. And that's a big problem, because like I said, the moon and the sun, if we're reading this from a literal rendering, came across on day four. Which brings a further issue, because if we're talking about literal days here also, the first and the second day, so that's a 24-hour time period, is what we are supposedly to believe about this event. Well, if that were true, then that's a 24-hour time period for day one, a day and a night, a 24-hour time period of a day and a night for the fourth day as well. And So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, they all have 24-hour days. But when we get to the seventh day, there's no night there. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all the hosts thereof. And the seventh day God rested from his works. And he rested on the seventh day from what he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because he had rested from all his work. There's no end. There's just day, seventh day, seventh day, seventh day. There is no night there. So we do have a bit of confusion and some contradictions going on if we are to take Genesis as a literal rendering of a physical creation. God said, let there be light, and God called the light day and darkness, and that creates confusion with day four. We also get the paradox of evening and morning. How can there be a day one with an evening and a morning without any astrological symbolism to meet those demands? And of course, the 24-hour clock. Well, Honestly, the issue is because Genesis does not depict a physical creation, but rather it is a motif. It's taking a look at what God has created and has taken that and applied that understanding to the creation of the covenant between Israel and God as written by Moses. So let's read this and see what it has to say about the heaven and the earth. Because remember, Moses wrote Genesis 1. And why did he write this? Why did he write the Torah, the five books of the law? Because this was the law agreement between God and Israel. And Moses is writing this out in and around 1500 BC. And Moses chooses to begin with, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's an interesting uh, thing that comes up later in Isaiah where it talks about, Behold, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. So this will give us an interesting contrast to come to grips in terms with how the Bible uses the terms heaven and earth. For in the beginning, when Moses wrote this down, it, it was called the heaven, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, now we see a promise of a new heaven and a new earth coming, which is interesting because in Revelation 21, John is also talking about this saying, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And that's what we're seeing here, right? We got the beginning, the first heaven, the first earth. Now we're getting a promise of a new heaven and a new earth because obviously that'll mean the first one passes away. Then I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, saying, uh, within it, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and he will be his, uh, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And that's exactly what Isaiah is talking about. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. I create a new Jerusalem. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. Hey, John goes on to say, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Isaiah continues on saying, no more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping. So obviously, we have Isaiah and John talking about the exact same thing, and most likely John was quoting Isaiah. So we have in Genesis, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. We have a promise of a new heavens and a new earth. And we have John talking about 
him seeing. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And when we continue this on in Isaiah 65, we read down to verse 19. When we continue on to verse 20, we get this inf- interesting information. It says, No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. Now, this is an interesting scripture because typically the people that have any biblical teaching or ex, you know, exposure to the concept of the new heaven and the new earth typically have the understanding that the new heaven and the new earth is an eternal place where you will have an eternal new body and everything about it will then likewise be forever, no sin, no corruption, no death, uh, and it'll be a place of perfection forever. However, as we can see straight from Revelation or straight from Isaiah 65, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, the same new heaven and new earth talked about in Revelation with John. It clearly says in Isaiah, for the young man shall die. So there's natural death. And the sinner and there's sin. So there's natural death and sin in the new heaven and the new earth. This is actually told to us also by John in Revelation 22, as we continue with his. So we were reading in Revelation 21, we get down to verse 4, we pick up again in verse 14, Revelation 22. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have a right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. So here you have the righteous who are alive in the new Jerusalem who went in through the gates. Well, outside, interesting, so outside of the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually the sexually immoral, the murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Revelation 22 clearly also tells us that there is sin and death in the new heaven and earth of the time period of John and Isaiah. See, we read murderers. Well, we know mur- to kill is a sin. The Ten Commandments clearly says thou shall not kill. We also understand that if you're a murderer, that means you're killing someone. So that means someone died. So that means there's death. So obviously, Revelation 22, there is sin and death. Just as there is sin and natural death as well in Isaiah 65, in the new heaven and the new earth. <clears throat> well then why if there if the new heaven and the new earth is not this perfection where we go to for eternity where nothing goes wrong well then why is there a new heaven and a new earth what does that even matter <clears throat> well in order to understand the new heaven and the new earth and the context that it's speaking in we need to understand the word spurned which means to reject with disdain or contempt. Now we read in Deuteronomy 31, later in that, so we have the Torah written by Moses, which included the five books of Moses, which is called the Law, which includes the book of Deuteronomy and Genesis. So here's Moses continuing from this topic about the creation of Genesis in the heaven and the earth language, moving forward through Genesis up to Deuteronomy, where they're establishing the law at this point in the story of Deuteronomy. And it says, Now therefore write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it into their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. Why? Because they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise me, and break my covenant. So we actually catch up at the time period here where the law is being established and God is telling Moses, look, these people of Israel, they're, they're going to betray me and go off and break my covenant. So take the song, put it in their mouths so that they will be accountable to themselves even because they will witness against them because I will put the truth into this song. And what does he teach them? He teaches them And this is the covenant of Deuteronomy, the covenant that God initialized and went into with Israel at the base of the mountain after bringing them out of Egypt. And he said in the Song of Moses, the Lord saw it and spurned them. 
What are we talking about again? This is God charging Israel, giving them this song to be a witness against them. Why? Because they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise God and break his covenant. And it says, And the Lord saw it and rejected with disdain or contempt them because of the provocation of the sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. Now, this was put in their mouths as a witness against them, that God promised, I will reject them, Israel, with disdain or contempt because of the uh, provocation of Israel. And as a result, God will hide his face from them because at their very end, they are going to be a perverse generation. They will be children with no faith. Therefore, a fire is kindled in my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol and devours the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. So now here we have specific language talking about the covenantal promise of judgment upon Israel and how God's fire is kindled in his anger against them for this and it will devour the earth. That's very interesting. Maybe we're starting to see why we might need a new heaven and a new earth. For God sets on fire even the foundations of the mountains. When we continue on in Numbers 32, in that same law book of the Torah, it says, and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel. So interesting. So now we're witnessing a kindling of God's anger. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And behold, you have risen in your father's place a brood full of sinful men to increase the still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness and you will destroy all this people. <clears throat> so here we have an example of when Moses was leading Israel through the wilderness to the promised land that God had promised to give them. But the Lord's anger was kindled against them because they were grumbling and they were upset that there was harsh times. And so in this situation, God, at the grumbling of the people, said, these people are not worthy of entering into the promised land. So what he did was he created a 40-year generation judgment. And this time period was the time period that he saw fit for the evil covenant people to be destroyed, for those of Israel that grumble against him. Now, this is a very important concept to get because this is the covenant promise of God, is a fire is kindled and it destroys and devours the earth. And here we have the Lord's anger being kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years, one biblical generation, until all the grumblers, the non-covenantal believers, died off. And then at the bottom here it says, and he will again abandon them if they do this again. And, a, and again, this is all following in the footsteps of the fathers, a brood of sinful men. Verse 14, and behold, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men. Now, what's interesting in Matthew 23, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes, the priest class of Israel, saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. 
Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. Very interesting thing here. Because what do we have? We have a group of fathers that lived with the righteous and the prophets. And they have become a brood of sinful men. Just as was charged in verse 14, you have risen in your father's place a brood of sinful men. And here are the children of the men who adorned the monuments of the prophets before them, testifying even against themselves that they are, as charged in verse 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, you brood of sinful men. So, if this continues on, then we should be followed this by a 40-year or a generational judgment upon this sinful men, this sinful brood of vipers. And that's exactly what we find in Matthew 23, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape the sentence of hell? And that's the judgment that was coming upon them. Therefore I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you, scribes and Pharisees, you, you brood of vipers, upon you may come all righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. All the way back to Abel. All the way back to Genesis 4. And here we're seeing this pers- this judgment is coming upon this gener- this group of people. And this goes all the way back to, it says, all righteous blood shed on earth. All the way back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And Abel was the first murdered of that line, of that, of, of that time in Genesis 4. And Jesus continues on saying, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. A 40-year time period stamped exactly as we see in Numbers 32. The Lord's anger is kindled against Israel. So he's giving them a 40-year period to destroy all the evil covenant people, those who have rejected the word, because they have been become a brood of sinful men. Therefore, just as the scripture in Numbers 32 says, if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them, Israel, in the wilderness. And what does he say here to finish this off? Truly I say, all these, will co- all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the ones that kill the prophets. And what's to come upon them? He said all these things to fill up the measure, the sentence of hell, the judgment of hell, the great persecution from town to town, so that upon Jerusalem, during that generation, those scribes and Pharisees would receive the judgment of their sin. And that will carry the weight all the way back to Genesis's earth, Genesis 1. Leaving that conversation, Jesus leaves the temple and says, Truly I say to you, this temple, none of it will be left here standing. There will not be left one here stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Well, his disciples came to him after saying, Well, tell us, when it, when's this going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of this age? And Jesus says to them, See to them that no one leads you astray. So just as he went through a list of what was going to come upon the Pharisees and the scribes, and then tells about the temple being destroyed, the entire center of all Hebrew belief, the, the, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us. When will these things take place? And Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation, this 40-year period, will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. That's very fascinating to know. 
Do you not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. That's fascinating because here we have a judgment coming upon Israel with a 40-year uh, covenantal time period judgment because of their apostasy. And it says, truly, this generation will not pass away, but heaven and earth will until all those things take place. And here we read in Matthew 5, the connection between heaven and earth will not pass away. Not an iota, not a dot from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them will be called, the, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So that means that the law of Moses is completely and fully in power as long as heaven and earth are not passed away. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Just like this said, until all is accomplished. Well, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Luke 21 continues, So also, when you see these things taking place, you will know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Peter, leader of the apostles, experiencing all of Jesus' ministry, standing before the crowd on the day of Pentecost, says, uh, Acts says, Peter, standing with them, lifted up his voice and addressed the men, saying, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. This is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days, so let's hit that. Peter is saying this, what he is talking about, is what was prophesied by Joel, and Joel prophesied about the last days. So Peter is claiming that it's the last days. And he says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he says to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this generation. 2,000 years ago, Peter speaking the message of generational judgment that was given to him right from the mouth of Jesus that was proclaimed over top of the Pharisees and the priesthood. Peter continues and tells these people, upon this generation, so be saved. And fascinatingly, at that preaching, at that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out of Egypt, in which we read, Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. And Joshua heard the noise of the peoples as they shouted, and he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, it is not the sound of shouting or victory, it is the sound of cry or defeat, but it's the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. 
Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he told them to put your sword on your side. Get ready and go to and fro, gate to gate, throughout the whole camp, each of you, and kill your brother and your companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the words of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. 3,000 men fell at the initiation of the covenant of death of Moses. And just as Jeremiah promised, the new covenant will not be like the old covenant. And at the calling of Peter and the repentance to the people, 3,000 were added. Peter, continuing on with his ministry, goes on to say in Peter's second letter, chapter 3, that they will say, where is the promise of his coming? All things are continuing as they did from the beginning of creation, for they deliberately overlook that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. The world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Now we know the 40-year period clock is on, the day of judgment is going. Nobody knows exactly the day or the hour, and the heavens and the earth that now exist are prepared for destruction. And that's what Peter is teaching that generation they're going to be saved from. In Deuteronomy, remember it says that this song will be a witness against Israel because they broke God's covenant. That it was through this, that God would reject Israel and he would look upon them to see what their end would be and their end would be filled with a perverse generation, children in which there is no faithfulness, which is what Jesus called them directly, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Deuteronomy 32 tells us that our Fire is kindled, which will devour the earth of Israel. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, says Jesus. And he goes on to say how I wish it were already kindled. Deuteronomy 32, for a fire is kindled in my anger and burns to the lowest parts of Sheol or hell, devours the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. And Jesus proclaims, I have come to cast fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. For we have heard him say this, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asks? The chief priests, the leaders of the religion, the head of all belief, the leaders, the chief priest answered and said, On behalf of Israel, we have no king but Caesar. Israel's rejection of Messiah, my covenant, which they broke. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. What sort of people ought you to be? speaking to his counterparts 2,000 years ago, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire, and the heavenly bodies will melt and burn. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Now let's listen to what Flavius Josephus, the first century Roman Jewish historian, military leader, best known for the Jewish war, who was born in Jerusalem, father to priestly descent, and a mother who claimed royal ancestry. The Jewish Roman historian who eyewitnessed the destruction of Israel in AD 70. 
He says, So Titus retired to the Tower of Antonia and resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning with his whole army and to encamp, encamp around about the holy house. But as for the house, God had for certain long ago doomed it to the fire, and now that fatal day was come. And at that time, one of the soldiers, without staying for any orders, and without any concern or dread upon him, at so great an undertaking, and being hurried on by a certain divine fury, snatched somewhat out of the materials that were on fire, and being lifted up by another soldier, he set fire to a golden window, through which there was a passage to the rooms that were round about the holy house, on the north side of it, and as the flames went upward, and the Jews made a great clamor, such as so mighty an affliction required, and ran together to prevent it, and now they spared not their lives any longer, nor suffered anything to restrain their force, since that holy house was perishing, for the sake it was that they kept such a guard on it. I cannot but think that it was because God had doomed this city to destruction, as a polluted city, and was resolved to purge his sanctuary by fire, that he cut off those who clung to them with such tender affection. The siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Roman military blockade of Jerusalem during the first Jewish revolt, the fall of the city marked the effective conclusion of a four-year campaign against the Jewish insurgency in Judea. The Romans destroyed much of the city, including the second temple, by burning it to the ground. Now, Jesus said in and around AD 30 that in one generation this all those things would come upon them, including the temple's destruction, the new age, and the destruction of heaven and earth. And that one year, 40 year judgment generational period in which all the non-believers would be killed off according to the law in Numbers that 40-year generational chance of repentance which was given to them saw the destruction of heaven and earth in and or before AD 70. Well, the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> the Holy of Holies is the sanctuary. It is the temple. It is the term in the Hebrew Bible that refers to the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle where God's presence appeared. The Ark, according to Hebrew scripture, contained the Ten Commandments which were given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be kept. The Holy of Holies is the holiest site in Jerusalem. Jewish tradition views the Holy of Holies as the spiritual junction of heaven and earth, the axis mundi, where God himself comes down out of heaven and penetrates into our earthly realm, where our prime material is, where we exist. That's where God meets us. That's the junction between heaven and earth. And this is the Holy of Holies where God's presence is. And that was in the tabernacle of Moses. Now what's interesting is Josephus, who was born in a Levitical class of high stature and held high wealth and great education, which led him into the roles that he played. Well, his understanding of the, Levit of the priesthood, uh, he speaks towards a bunch of these concepts, and one of them happens to be the tabernacle. And we're going to give a listen to how he describes it. For he describes it as, When Moses distinguished the tabernacle into three parts, and allowed two of them into the for the priests as a plain or place accessible rather to the common he denoted the land and the sea that those were the ones being the general access to all and he set apart the third division for god because heaven is inaccessible to men now when you read genesis 1 through 18 you understand what he's talking about because the language used in Genesis 1.18 draws this picture. So in the beginning, we've got the water. So we have, and I'm going to assume that you've read Genesis 1 at least a couple times. And if not, pause the video, go read it so that this is going to be fresh to you. Because we don't have time to cover all that material again. However, we do know that the waters were separated from the waters. And the waters above 
versus the waters below. So we get this dividing line between it, which God called the firmament. Now, underneath the waters, the waters were divided into one place, causing dry land to appear. Now, the waters were called the seas, and darkness was upon the waters and the seas, and they were also called the night. That's the lesser light. That's the moon that was put over them. Then we also have the dry land. Now, the interesting thing about the dry land is it was called earth, right? God caused the waters to draw together, revealing the dry land, which was called earth. Well, day four says that the lights that were in the firmament were to give light on the earth, and that was called day. So we have that interesting image because we have the waters above, which was where God is. We have the waters below, separated into two groups, the sea and the earth, the dry land. Now, when we take a look at what Moses built and the instructions given, which was referred to as the tabernacle of Moses, which continued on until David continued that exact same in the tabernacle of David, which grew until Solomon, where Solomon built the tabernacle of Solomon, in which all of these concepts were built right into the physical temple. Now, when we zoom in here, this is the, if you're unaware, this is the uh, Solomon's temple. And in, we have these uh, different furnishings all over the different inside and outside of the temple. So this is the tabernacle. The, that's what it was referred. There would be a giant uh, walls around this and all this would be inside this walled area. This is the tabernacle. And in the deepest, most inner part of the tabernacle is called the Holy of Holies. That's what we just read where God enters in. And right in the deepest part of Holy of Holies is the tabernacle uh, or inside the tabernacle is the Ark of the Covenant with the, ta the tablets of Moses guarded by the cherubim. And that's where God is, the holy God is present. Now there's a veil in front. You can kind of see here, it's kind of like a folded doorway. That is the veil that blocks the Holy of Holies from anything else. This room is completely solid gold on the inside. Like it's laid in solid like. It's laid in gold all the way around the walls. Everything in here is uh, gold, and it is separated by this veil, which leads into the, in, into the inner sanctuary. Now, when we're inside here, this spot was only allowed to be populated by the priesthood. No man except the Levites were allowed into this chamber. Now this chamber, all of this area, there is no windows that are uh, lighting this up, which is why the lampstands are very important inside here, because that's what gives the light to the priests, the workers of the things of God. They had access to come in before God, do the rituals that are required of them, and they would come to and fro. And this area is the firmament which divides the heavens above from the below. So the whole temple area is the above where God is present. And then we have the firmament where the lights are to shine light on the earth, which was below. And the earth is represented by the bronze altar which is for the burnt offerings. Now, this is an interesting understanding because the, brought, the burnt offerings was for the sin atonement. So this was for covenant people. This was for the people who had their sins forgiven and washed away by the burnt sacrifice offering. So the earth, the burning dry land, the earth was for the covenant people. And it says that the light would come down through the firmament and shine light on the earth, the covenant people. So the Holy of Holies, God, his presence was divided from the peoples, the sea and the earth, by this firmament. And then we had the Levitical priesthood who would come out and minister to the earth. Now across from there, we see this other structure referred to as the sea. Now this is actually called the sea. And you can go look this up. You can see the references below, 1 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and in another couple places, I do believe, but those two are mentioned. And it's literally called the sea. 
It was a metal basin containing 12,000 gallons or 44,000 liters of water. And this is part of the, you would come from the outside, you'd come through the gate, and the priest would wash you and cleanse you in the sea, your baptism, and then you would be brought to the earth where the sacrifice was made to you on the earth. Now you were a covenant people and your sins were forgiven. And then that sin offering was then presented by the Levitical priesthood into the Holy of Holies before God, and the sin atonement was complete. So the entire structure of the tabernacle, just as outlined and pointed out by Josephus, which is absolutely true, pointed out in Genesis 1, describes and draws for us the three tiers as described completely perfectly in the construction of the tabernacle of Moses, David, Solomon, and even Herod, when he rebuilt it, built it to these exact parameters. Now we have read Deuteronomy where God was charging Israel with the Song of Moses because they were about to break the covenant. And this is what he said. So in Deuteronomy 31 to 32 it says, Then Moses spoke the words of this song and they, until they were finished in the ear of all the assembly of Israel. Okay, so get that. Moses spoke the word of this song in the ear of of Israel, and this is how it's recorded. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Give ear the ears, O heaven, Israel, and I will speak the words of this song. Second line, and let the earth, Israel, hear the words of my mouth, the ears and the words. The declaration of the song of Moses, which is the law itself declares Israel is heaven and earth as completely depicted by the tabernacle of Genesis 1. The heavens above, the earth below, and the sea. The heavens, the earth, and the sea. The law says, Oh, how I love your law in Psalm 119. <coughs> It says, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. Your rules you have taught me. Your precepts, I get understanding. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and have confirmed it. So give me life according to your word. Teach me your rules. So that's the old covenant. Well, Jeremiah says, behold, there is a new covenant coming. It says, Behold, the days are coming when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. And he goes on to say, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. He who stirs up the sea so that it wave, its waves roar, and the Lord of hosts is its name. If this fixed order departs from before me, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. So if this fixed order departs, the fixed order of the sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, and the fixed order of the sea. As long as that's in place, so is the covenant with Israel. But the new covenant will not be like it. Genesis 1, the Old Covenant, the one governed by the sun for light by day, the moon and the stars by night, and stirring up the sea. Genesis 4, the lights that separate the light for the light by night and light by day. The fixed order, the Old Covenant, heaven and earth. Luke 22, 20, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Revelation 21.1 And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no more sea. Well, that's a big deal, because we just read the fixed order. He who stirs up the sea. And this new covenant will end this order 
of the sun, the moon, stars, and the sea. And here we see the new cu- the new heaven and the new earth, and there's no more sea. The fixed order is departed. I saw no temple, for in it its temple is the Lord God and the Lamb. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. The glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's right from Psalm 119. The law says, a light to my feet, a lamp to my path. But now God gives light, and the lamp is the Lamb. There is no need for the sun or the moon. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. This is the new heaven and the new earth. This is the new covenant. These are the words that will not pass away, even though heaven and earth did. Nothing unclean will ever enter into it, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now remember what we were talking about in Genesis 2, that the heavens and the earth were finished on the seventh day, and he rested, and there was no night there. And here we have, in the new heaven, in the new earth, they were finished. Were they not? There was no night there, just like it says, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The heavens and the earth were finished, and I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first earth and first heaven had passed away. Now, the heavens and the earth were finished, and there was no night there. And that's the new heaven and the new earth, where the day, the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. That's day seven. And it said to me, it is done. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and there was no night there. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, I am the Omega. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Promise fulfilled. Psalm 119, I am severely afflicted. Give me life according to your word. Psalm 119, I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. That's the Exodus agreement. If you will indeed obey my covenant and keep my, uh, obey my voice and keep my covenant, Then you shall be a treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. For these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And Peter, to those who have accepted the word of truth that he presented, those who were of the generation who who gave off the old and put on the new, what did he say to them? He said likewise to them that you are a chosen generation. You are the royal priesthood. You are the holy nation, the peculiar people. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Fulfillment of the covenant. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there was no more sea. Declaring the end from the beginning All things are fulfilled. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there was no sea. If you appreciate my work and would like to support me, you can easily do so at the website and uh, email provided in this slide. And I would like to invite you to come over to Better Understanding the Bible, where we get into these topics in much, much, 
more data uh, detail and clarity as this is just a light introduction to the concepts presented into the Bible that we deal with over there. And if you're already on that site and watching, I want to thank you especially. I really appreciate the support that you give. It helps me and spurs me on to continue and pushing. So wherever you are, I want to just say thank you very much and God bless.